UNO has always been an expanding university, constantly moving forward. But as we move forward, we must also look back to where we began. Let's go back in time with the people who remember UNO the way it was. Join us for Reflections in Time. It's a very cold day in December, but a beautiful day, and we're out on West Dodge here in Omaha, and we're involved in what I've come to call reflections in time at the university. It's been a series of tapes, many, many hours of tape, of people who've had a short or a long-term time involvement with the University of Nebraska at Omaha, or the University of Omaha, as we call it for so many years. This, over the years, has involved some 50 to 60 people. As I said, we're out on West Dodge today, and there's a reason we aren't doing them as we often do on the campus with people who retired from professorial ranks or part of the staff. We're visiting in the office of Chuck Durham and his wife, Marge, and the reason we're doing that is because these people, along with an attachment to so many groups, and organizations, uh, political, educational, you name them, they've been involved for so many years in our community and in fairly recent years, they've had a very great impact on the life of our community known as the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And so I thought it was very appropriate that we stop by, and I'm glad you would have us, and talk to you two folks about your lives and about the many things that have gone on in the many, many years that you've been together. But what I like to do as we begin these reflections in time, and we can start with ladies first if you like, Chuck, or either way, we'll... Uh, ask about your beginnings. Where did it all start for, for you, Marge? Well, my life started right here in Omaha, Nebraska. I was born on 36th Street and lived there all my life until I was married. Is that right? And um, uh, I had wonderful parents, loving parents. Went to field club school. Oh, did you? On um, 36th and Center. Mm -hmm. And then went from there to Central High School. And from Central High School, I went to um, uh, Rockford College for one year, and then to Iowa State College, Rockford University College, yeah. in Ames, Iowa. Uh -huh. uh, my father attended school there, and I and was a very loyal alumni. I'd heard nothing but that for years, so it seemed very natural for me to go there. And I went there, and while I was there, I met a nice young man. The man who's sitting uh, next to you? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. met several nice young men. <laughs> but... Um, uh, the nicest one I married, uh -huh. and he's right here today, and we've been married now for a long time. What did you yeah. major in college, Marge? Beg your pardon? What was your major in college? Textiles and clothing. Oh, was it? Uh-huh. But I didn't have a chance to do much with it after I got out of college because I went right kind of from the universe, right from college to the altar. Oh, you were married and, uh, upon graduation. Uh -huh. Well, so. Chuck, I think it's up to you now. Where did uh, life start for you? Well, Paul, I was born in Chicago, and uh, my dad was an engineer with the Iowa Highway Commission. We moved around to different towns in Iowa, but finally, when I was about in the sixth grade, we centered, we moved to uh, Ames, Iowa, oh. and that became my home until after I got out of college. So it, uh, you grew up and you went to college right in your hometown, really? It was right in the Depression, and I had a chance to go to one school and that was in my hometown. And in those days, one was fortunate to be able to go to college you at really, all. You really were. And at that time, Iowa State was a heavily agriculture and engineering school, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Those two main majors were involved, weren't they, Jennifer? Well, they were supposed to be outstanding yeah. in both those yeah. courses. Still is a good school. Indeed so, yeah. Well, after college, now you've both been through college, and as Marge said, you almost immediately became married. You made that decision early in life then, and mm -hmm. what year might this have been about that you, that you were married? 1940. Uh -huh. So we will come, uh, we're going into our 50th anniversary next year. Wow, that's going to be a, uh -huh. a big celebration that here, is. 50 years. Yeah, it really is. And did you immediately make your home here in Omaha? You're mm -hmm. a young guy out of college now. You're gonna to go to work someplace. Where did it all really get rolling for you there, Chuck? Well, when I entered college, I. I entered it with the idea of becoming a lawyer. Did you? And I was uh, 
taking engineering as a pre-law course, and I met Marge, and her dad was uh, was the outstanding, well, he ran the outstanding engineering firm, the Henningsen Engineering Company here in Nebraska. And at the time, he was about 60 years old, and he, uh, he had several discussions with me about forgetting the law and uh, taking more engineering and coming in with him, mm -hmm. which I decided to do, and I've never been sorry about it. No, indeed. I've been much happier as an engineer than I would have been as, a, as an attorney. But uh, that's sort of, and then after the, uh, after graduation, I came to work here and, and uh, with the exception of the war years, I've been here ever since. You know, you mentioned the 40 some years of married life you had, and all of them have basically been then, been then here in Omaha. What was Omaha like when you first, first came here and settled down. Now, you knew it as a young girl and all, but Omaha was a different city, certainly, than mm -hmm. it is today. It was totally different. You know, it, it's a very friendly, elegant city uh, with brick-paved streets and uh, streetcars and things went at a leisurely pace. Uh, there were no shopping centers. No. We had a nice downtown area and uh, uh, several uh, hotels, the Paxton, the Blackstone, and uh, Fontenelle. the Fontenelle. Oh, I remember them. Yeah. And uh, uh, the tree-lined streets, you had practically no traffic. It's a very easy-going, nice city to live in. It's totally changed today. Yeah. The streets are jammed. Uh, it's much larger. Everything goes at a frantic pace. Where we're sitting now at Durham Plaza it's was way out course. in the country, wasn't mm -hmm. it? It was a golf course. Yeah, Indian Hills That's Golf right. Course. Indian Hills Golf Course. That's what it was when I first moved to Omaha in the early 50s. People used to wear hats and gloves, ladies did. In our first house, we didn't have a, we'd leave town and we didn't have a house key. We didn't know where it was. We had one, we lost it. We'd leave town and not worry. So it's all changed. Yeah. Don't but do that anymore. Of course, the thing that makes a place, whether it's a business or a city or a block, interesting are the people often. And over the years, mm -hmm. you had attachments to tons and tons of people. But I think one thing that I'd like to have you share a little bit about in more detail, and you started into a little bit of a Chuck, was your own families, your roots, the people. Mm -hmm in your family that you remember and some of the interesting happenings that stand out on either side of the family before we move into more recent history? Well, at the time I grew up, I could say the time we grew up, family units were very, very close. And we all had grandparents, and I had grandparents who lived with us and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and. And I absolutely adored my grandparents and really gleamed a lot from them. And I had grandparents on both sides. And my one grandparents, a set of grandparents, were farmers over in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And I had relatives over there, and they were all farmers. And I used to go over there and visit every summer. My highlight was going to the farm and visiting. What Just part of Iowa it. was this? Ellsworth, Iowa. Oh, yeah. I know the place. But I always got there in gooseberry season. <laughs> I had to pick those awful gooseberries that were so <laughs> sticky. But um, uh, I love I mean, my... Great pie, though. Oh, yeah, great pie. But I love my summers on the farm, and mm -hmm. that was really kind of a highlight. And then uh, as I got older, um, I became a little interested in camping, went up to Minnesota or Wisconsin camping. And my mother was a counselor, and we weren't people of great means at all. And my mother was a counselor so that my brother and sister and I could go up there tuition free. Oh. And um, uh, she loved to camp, so, and we did too, so that was, that was another highlight. But an awful lot that we did, we did as a family. And um, uh, that part sort of stayed with us. And we've tried to carry those 
values into our own family mm -hmm. now and um, have really had a good time doing it. You know, the thing you mentioned about living with your grandparents, mm. this idea of two and three generations being in the same home, uh -huh. that didn't used to be at all unusual, was it? Well, not it? at all. Very common, very common. But of course, you have to realize at that point in time, grandparents used to sort of do the mending and the rocking. Yeah. And Grandma is on the tennis court now. <laughs> so it's a little bit different than it used to be. She's on the golf course, the tennis court, and, and you know, the sure. people have changed. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, fortunately, people are uh, a little stronger, healthier than they used to be. So they can do some things they didn't do at that point in time. Well, and we were talking before we started to make this tape in your office mm -hmm. today about uh, mainly people out on the farm where mm -hmm. you spent a lot of time just plain worked. Didn't have time for golf or you. tennis or anything or vacations. It was seven days a week you of chores you. and mm -hmm. so on. How about your early days, Chuck, and the family, those around you when you first grew up? Well, most of my early life was spent in Ames, Iowa, which was a nice city to grow up in. Yeah, it's a nice town. I had a paper route for about five years. That's your first job? First job. <laughs> And really a paper boy then was a small businessman. Sure. I'd have to pick up my papers every morning at five o'clock in the morning. And there were no cold day exceptions. <laughs> I don't care if it was 20, 25 below zero, you carried your papers. A day like the day you'd oh, be absolutely. out there. absolutely. And uh, there was school every day. They didn't let schools out to give the professors a <laughs> few extra days <laughs> vacation a year. <laughs> And we we had to go to school, but uh, Ames was a good city to grew up in. It had a public library about three blocks from my house, and I just read one book after another. We didn't have the television or no. all the amusements that kids have today. Can you think of anybody, one of your teachers or someone, that really generated an interest in reading, so you got involved with that, which is such a great thing? How did that? Well, there wasn't anything else to do, Paul. Mm -hmm. And once you get the habit, uh, yeah. but I've always been a reader until uh, my eyes aren't a hundred percent anymore, and I read a little bit slow, especially in fine print, and mm -hmm. it's taken a little gloss off of it. But uh, I still enjoy reading. Yeah. Well, so much of what we enjoy and what we do and the way we form our own lives comes out of our, our roots and our background. And mm -hmm. you made that emphasis, Marge, a moment ago about family and the things, how but close I you were. I mentioned going with Marge's dad after I graduated. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I got a degree in uh, general engineering, which is now called industrial engineering, mm -hmm. in 1939. And then I got another degree in 1940 in civil engineering. Oh, and later on in 44, I got a professional degree in engineering. And that gave me a pretty good background to get into this field here. Has everything's so much complicated, much more complicated yeah. today that... Uh, yeah, I was gonna ask you about that. Uh, the engineering world, which you've spent so much of your life, uh, what are some of the major things, to the layman at least, that have changed? You say it's more complicated. Some of the projects you were involved with early on were rather simple, were they then, in a comparative way? Yeah, they were, really were. You know, uh, for instance, an architect could design a public building, you know, and drop all the plans himself, and uh, uh, the mechanical, electrical, and and build a building it was a pretty simple affair. Mm -hmm. Today, you know, you need a whole team of engineers and architects, and there's all sorts of permits and inspections and technology that goes into almost everything. Do these factors that you just described add to the beauty of the building or just sort of a drag on the whole operation? Oh, I think they add. Gee, these modern buildings are marvelous now yes. in comparison. Yeah. I mentioned a while ago to you when we were waiting for the setup here that that at that time the state of Nebraska and Western Iowa is really sort of a desert. 
back during the uh, drought days of the Depression, uh, they had very inadequate rainfall here, and, and the state really just dried up. And no irrigation going. Outside of West, uh, outside of Omaha, and you get out driving along the road, you see thousands of jackrabbits everywhere, jackrabbits, mm -hmm. dead jackrabbits on the road. See towns of prairie dogs. How long has it been since you've seen a prairie dog? Oh, yeah. And vacant farmhouses and and uh, abandoned farms. Uh, I think, as I mentioned a while ago, and uh, in all fairness to everybody I know, I think Marge's dad, H. H. Henningsen, did more to transform the state into a garden than any man that uh, I can think of. Now maybe there is. You might argue that, but he was a consulting engineer then, and when the rural electrification came into being to make life more bearable on the farm, uh, he went out and organized these public REA districts. This is now the early 1930s, isn't it, really? Well, it's the... When is uh, that, about mid-30s? Mid-30s yeah. on. Late, yeah. you know, yeah. Late 30s. And at one time, he had organized every REA district in Nebraska, and many in, in western Iowa, and some in Kansas and Missouri. Are these are geographical districts that were laid well, out? they could be a county, like uh -huh. Burt County Rural Public Power yeah, District, yeah. or Cumming County. Uh, uh -huh. And he'd go out and uh, meet with a group of farmers, and they'd say, oh yeah, we'd like to have electricity. So he'd get them together to form a district and they'd elect officers and then he'd go to the REA and make an application for what was called a pre-allotment loan. And uh, with the pre-allotment loan then he would uh, make some studies of how you could run transmission lines through the area and, and bring them electricity to the farms. Mm -hmm. And along with that came feasibility studies and then the REA back at Washington would make grants in order to build these. And they'd stake them out and supervise the construction. With with water to the farmers came pump irrigation, yeah. electricity, uh, and with modern technology today, the, the farmers got a machine or a tool, something electrical for almost everything. And life on the farm can be as comfortable as it is in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe more so. Yeah, yeah the so farm you, you talked about was a different he, one, wasn't it? He yeah. also designed and, and uh, built hundreds and hundreds of waterworks systems, sewer systems, all over the Midwest. Imagine living in a town without a waterworks or sewer yeah. system. We take all those things for granted But now. most of these towns didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you know, to these young fellows here in the room, uh, it's pretty hard to think of uh, going out on a day like today to a two-holder and uh, with nothing to flush. And Chuck. You didn't go so often. No, no. <laughs> Life was difficult and it was different. It was different, you bet. Well, he really changed the face of things, as you he might really say. He really did. Yeah. Well, as life developed, uh, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, and we could come to it now, right? let's talk about it now. You have, uh, uh, in your many married years, along with a long career in the engineering world, have a family, you two. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little about them. And uh, as I understand it, a very close family. Well, we have a very fine family, and really it's due to they have a very good mother. That's often you didn't the case. hurt a bit. So. <laughs> I'd like, you never hurt a bit. I'd like to have a. I will have a recording of that after this session. <laughs> I guess. Yes, you will. <laughs> but uh, in in my life, I've had to travel a lot. Mm -hmm. The uh, our engineering company, as it came to be known as Henningsen, Durham, and Richardson, we had work all over the world, and uh, when our kids were all little. I was always going somewhere to Washington or to Des Moines or to Madrid or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And Marge had four little kids to look after and she looked after them. She still does. 
Now I'm her only child. <laughs> <laughs> now she is a real child. My, my problem child. But we've got, we've got a fine family, and I really give her the credit for it. Well, what you described yeah. earlier has a sense for that. You came out of strong family, and that helped you to build one, didn't it? Well, we, we really um, are we're very fortunate. Our family all live in the Omaha area. Uh, three of them are in Omaha, and the one farthest away is Fremont. Is that right? So I uh, spent we spent all our lives getting ready for them to leave. No, <laughs> you, you hear about it, that? You prepare yourself for them to, you know for the emptiness syndrome. Yeah, yeah. And they all stayed. Well, isn't that but interesting? It's been absolutely great, and uh, we have nine wonderful grandchildren <coughs> who also love the Midwest, and that, whatever happens there, who knows? They'll perhaps do whatever's right for them. Sure. But um, we've we've had wonderful, wonderful, happy family times together, and we still have good times together. We all get together. Thanksgiving, we all went into Chicago together, all 19 of us. Isn't that wonderful? So we, we have good times together. So, um, and I think that that, I, I was never a career person, per se. I mean, I didn't, you know, have the, have the professional career. Mm -hmm. but I think I had the greatest job in the world. And I think that was the only job I ever really wanted, was to be a mother and a housewife. Well, and you developed ties here that go on and on. But more than that, too, as you mentioned that, I think of something I looked at before we got together for this taping today. Someone gave me a sheet, Tim Fitzgerald out mm -hmm. at the university, whom you know, gave me a sheet of all the things that you were involved with. And I have never seen a list quite that long for a lady of any persuasion. Uh, you to Holly, this, that, the other thing, you have a very full life too. Maybe that well, came in part been. two from his being gone a lot and your chance to help and do things when he was gone too. Well, it, it, it did come from that a lot because when the children were young, um, I was home with them all the time. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as they reached a point where they didn't need me for a playmate, you know, their, their lives reached out and broadened. Yeah. Then um, I realized that I needed interest, things to keep me active and interesting too. And so um, I w became involved in community activities. But while the children were growing up, in their growing years, the only activities I ever did while they were growing up were things that were pertained to them. You know, the scouting and school activities yeah. and, and um, uh, educational things, things that, that really were close to them and involved them. So they felt that what I was doing was something that they understood and, sure. and related to and and was something we shared children I mean, we just sort of shared the a common interest there then as they got a little older then i went out into more challenging things in the community and then i became community oriented and chuck was still traveling and um uh then as the children reached the point where they were pretty independent then I started tra traveling quite a bit with Chuck, uh -huh. and we've had an awfully good time traveling together, doing things, and we've really sort of caught up for some of the years that, you know, I stayed home. Yeah, I know I'm trying to set up this taping, it was kind of like catching a couple of flies. <laughs> you were gone, hither and yon, you were gone, or you both I were, know. but finally we made it. So this is sort of a different time uh -huh. of your life. The time that you described, though, and all the organizations you were a part of, I think a lot of people do some of this sort of thing. I think few have been as involved as you have. What were some of the things that interested you most about community and getting involved? You too, Chuck, you were involved with the chamber and other things. He's done uh, a lot. I wonder why people do some of these things. They have a busy life of their own. They have a business, they have a family, they have children, as you've described, and yet you start to reach out. What are some of the reasons, if you can think back in your lives, that you sort of got going on all these things? Yeah, but number one, I love children, and anything that had to do with children, almost I do. And I haven't changed in a lot. I'm still very, very interested in, in activities and and things that that um, pertain to young people. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason I think Chuck and I are both interested in education, mm -hmm. because we feel that that so directly affects the youth of our country and ultimately the well-being of our country. Oh, indeed, so you've had strong so, attachments both to your alma mater and other places too mm -hmm. over the years. Education. We both like youth. We both we both like young people and uh -huh. working with and for. And Chuck's been very active in scouting and and um, things like that. So I, th I think there's been a great carryover, don't you think so, Chuck? And 
Well, I was explaining to Paul a while ago, I don't think you were in the room, mm -hmm. but uh, we had to work awful hard uh, in our engineering and architectural business. And most of our work in the early years, I'm thinking of the 1940s, was here in Nebraska and Western Iowa, a lot of driving and uh, uh, some, some, almost every month I'd go to at least 20 console meetings somewhere. Wow. One month I had 37. <laughs> There's a lot of them in console bluffs. But in 1952, I uh, got a letter to go to a dinner of the Chamber of Commerce or a luncheon and they were trying to form the committee of, 19, of, of 52 they called it mm -hmm. which would be 52 of the leading businessmen in Iowa or in Nebraska and I went to the dinner and sat there at a table and I didn't know anybody at the table I looked around the room there were only two or three people in that whole room I knew <laughs> and uh, I thought, gee, it would be nice to know more people in Omaha. But I was so busy that I really didn't have a chance to, to get out. We didn't do much socially at that time. And uh, then I was invited to join the Rotary Club, and I got to know more people. And, and it wasn't long before I was invited to be a director of the Chamber of Commerce. And I was act became active in that, and uh, then in the 60s, uh, I was elected president of the chamber after being a vice president for a good many years. And that sort of got the ball rolling. I had a lot of fun and enjoying doing it. Great people in Omaha. And you really got to know them. Yeah, you get to way. know them, yeah. and you're part of the community. It's a great feeling. It's uh, you're not trying to do anything noble, but you just have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. And I feel sorry for anybody that uh, that really hasn't had that experience. The people you meet is a real fringe benefit of it. Mm. It really is, because you meet the nicest people. And I mentioned to you during those years uh, when I was president how, how uh, the University of Nebraska came to be part of the state system. Yeah, when we were called the University of Omaha. Puny Someone came and visited with you, didn't they? Puny Muni U. Yeah, yeah. Way back. Would you like to have me tell yeah, that story tell that again? Yeah, It involved Cliff Harden and some people that uh, I think they enjoy seeing this as a part of our tape. Yeah. Well, one morning when I was in Washington, I was staying at the Madison Hotel, and and I happened to run into Cliff Harden in the coffee shop. We had sat down and had breakfast together. And we were doing a lot of work for the University of Nebraska. We designed their engineering building and science building and the work on their stadium and a lot of other stuff down there. Mm -hmm. And I got to know Cliff real well. And he said, Chuck, he said, uh, and I used to, use, when he'd ever asked me to do anything, I'd listen intently because he was a very, a very uh, important client to <laughs> us. He said, I'd like to have you I'd like to have you get the Omaha Chamber behind a move to make the University of Nebraska at Omaha part of the state system. And he said, I'll help you be behind the scenes. Had there been any rumblings? Had you heard anything of this up to this time? No, not really. But the, every day there were articles in the paper about how uh, the municipal university was falling apart. Uh, uh, there's a bond issue that was voted down. Yeah, yeah, they, did, yeah. they didn't have the money to run the school. Uh, many of the professors were quitting. Uh, it was just chaos out there. And uh, I don't remember whether Milo Bale was still in charge. I think he'd retired and Kurt Naylor was... Yes, he'd retired. He uh, was head of it. I think partly the reason was because of that mill uh, mm -hmm. levy bit that you've just described. Mm -hmm. So I came back from Washington, and I, uh, Kiewit Construction Company was in the same building with us, and I, I ran into Pete Kiewit in the garage, and I told him what I was thinking about the meeting in, in Washington with, uh, with Cliff Harden. Mm -hmm. And he said... Uh, he said, well, Chuck, I, I wish you luck, 
but he said, you don't have a chan one chance in hell ever getting anything like that done. <laughs> he said, the outstate people hate us here in Omaha, and why would they want to take over a defunct, bankrupt uh, university? And uh, He had a point there, didn't he, at the he time? He really did. But anyway, we had a meeting of the chamber board, and uh, they were all willing to give it a try. And I appointed Sid Kate, uh, chairman of a committee, to get in and and work on the problem. He from Gate City Steel, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was president of Gate City Steel. Yeah, yeah. And Sid was a good friend of mine, and uh, he just literally dropped everything. And for about a year, he just worked almost full time on this deal. Is that right? He went out and he had meeting after meeting. Uh, uh, with professors out there trying to encourage him and finding out what was wrong, uh, what he could do to get the ball rolling. He lobbied the legislators, uh, uh, gave a number of talks over the radio and television, and he just like a bulldog on it. And uh, to make a long story short, it went through by one vote. Yeah, that was close, wasn't yeah, it? And I think the people in Lincoln have always regretted it. <laughs> but it's been a great thing for Omaha. Did you ever know who did the vote? Who, who, who was the one know. vote? <laughs> yeah. They think they'd all take credit for yeah. it. Yeah. I was that one vote. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it started, and there are a lot of people that uh, can take credit for it being a reality, but... That was an interesting sidelight. I thought maybe you'd be interested. Yes, and as a sidelight, too, that perhaps gave you some of your early involvement, really, with the university, didn't it, Chuck? No, after that, I really had no involvement. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, until I got acquainted with Ron Roskins later on, we became oh. very good friends. When he was here as, mm -hmm. as the uh, chancellor of the university? But while we did a lot of architectural work for uh, the campus at Lincoln, we never did anything here on the Omaha campus oh. until later on. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Ron did an awful lot, though, toward bringing the university to the community. Yeah. And the people who did not know the university very well learned to know it through him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a lot of lecture series and he did a great and job. events that that made the people feel they were part of the university. I think that's how a lot of us became involved. Yeah, I think he started to really build some bridges in that period. He, did. Did. he definitely he? did. He definitely did. He opened doors that um, have remained open. And Del Weber has done an excellent job of keeping them open. Yeah. They both have been a great thing for Omaha. They have. They've done, and the university done. has grown Absolutely. and changed so much. Indeed it has. Well, if you think back, uh, well, to the 1960, 60, at the time it went into the state. And 68, I believe, was the year. There's one or two buildings out there. Yeah. And yeah. just, that's a great school now. It's really taken its place among top-notch universities. Still has a long ways to go. Oh, yeah. But uh, it'll get there. Yeah, and uh, you and your family have had a real part in it in these last years. I was wondering, and this goes back before the thing I enjoyed as I came out here today looking at that beautiful campanile, we'll come to that, but uh, the Durham Science Building, which is a marvelous place that involves thousands of people every semester now. How did that all come to be? Well, the University of Nebraska had a great salesman working for it <laughs> by the name of Woody Varner. Oh, yes, I remember him well. And... Uh, Marge and I wanted to do something for the school, and uh, I think her interests were more towards the liberal arts. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to do, you know, we we had, in HDR, we had uh, about 1,500 architects and engineers uh, working all over the country. A good many of them came from the University of Iowa. Mm -hmm. I mean, the... Uh, Iowa State University and also Nebraska University. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do something for both schools and uh, so we got together and and uh, 
gave some money which made possible the Durham Science Center at the university. And also uh, uh, the Center for Computation and Communication over at Iowa State University. And now, wasn't that a recent thing? Well, uh, fairly recent. But, uh, the buildings were completed in the, within the last few years. Mm -hmm. The one over at Iowa State was dedicated last summer. But uh, it's been a project that we worked on for, what, six years? Longer than the one at the University of Nebraska. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And I think they've both been very helpful to the both schools. Oh, that's the understatement of the tape, I'd say. <laughs> In terms of our campus, it's been a marvelous addition. And then more recently, something interesting came up, and I was visiting the other day with uh, Dr. Weber, and uh, who you mentioned just a moment ago, our current chancellor. And uh, somehow, you came to him, he said, one day with an idea, Marge. Was that right? Very possible. I don't think Chuck knew about it. <laughs> But well, I, he said I you did. came. I did. I kind of did. I think March told me that he came to her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's what I think that's what you sort of understood. <laughs> but anyway, uh, no, I think I did go to Dell and and tell him that that um, I would kind of like to do a little something for my parents. Do you have any idea um, then what it might be? Not really, because I didn't want to do anything the university didn't need, or that wouldn't enhance it. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, I said, why don't you give some thought to some things that you feel might be good for the university and need it and, or might enhance it? And then let's talk again. And we'll sort of weigh your suggestions and possibilities against what I feel I can do, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll take it from there. So it didn't take him a long time to get back to me. And um, uh, then we started talking about possibilities of a company on and that really appealed to me a lot did that come at all from your both of you and the uh -huh. campanile over at iowa state well that was a very meaningful uh, instrument over there yeah. really yeah uh it was in the center of the campus and we walked to campus all the time and and walked to classes and and that was playing all the time and it was very inspirational sure and i thought it could hopefully mean something like that here yeah. if we had it I was thinking in much smaller terms, and <laughs> Dell was interesting because the more we talked, the larger it got, and um, <laughs> the more I started shaking at the possibilities. <laughs> but um, uh, it started out with a few bells on the on top of the uh, old central building. No, right? over in the administration building. The old administration building. We sort of talked about putting a bell up there. We thought that might be a nice idea. That didn't ring for long, and. Uh, <laughs> Uh, then Dell started walking around the campus, and, and we sort of started talking, you know, different types of structures and that sort of thing. And Tell them a little bit about the bells and how you selected them. And yeah. Well, that was kind of fun too. But one of the things I really kind of enjoyed was was I wanted to know what the stu. I was interested in the students. I wanted to know how they felt about it mm -hmm. uh, because they were the ones that would ultimately be beneficiaries, along with the staff yeah. and. Uh, so I uh, asked for permission to go to the drawing class, architectural drawing class. And they, in turn, did some renderings. And it was really fun, because I visited with them a couple times. And then when it came time for the actual design work to be done, uh, I gave the renderings uh, to the architect and said, this is what the students like, and you know, whatever can work out, uh, let's you know, see what we can do. Mm -hmm. So we really did um, utilize some suggestions from the students. I think that's great. And then, uh, the, I, don't, I don't know, uh, but the students, those same, that same class has been kept um, advised as to the progress and all, and they were invited to the dedication and all, well, and because it felt that they'd had a part of it. But the one thing that they had that I, w I would not have thought of it's that plaza around the bottom, around the base. Oh, I think that's you know, lovely. For, for um, you know, meeting and yes. relaxing and yes. and that sort of thing. I would not have thought that. And I haven't. We visited Campaniles around the country prior to this, and um, uh, none of them had that. Well, this has a place where you can stop and that's spend right. a little time. 
But every each one of those students seemed to want something like that. To different, but they're all you know in different degrees. So that seemed to be a natural thing to incorporate into it. So they had, they had some input in to the actual design of it. One thing I looked at today before I came out to your office, Chuck, was the clock. And I heard there was, <laughs> the day of dedication, there was kind of an interesting story that Marge told about mm -hmm. uh, how the clock came to be. Uh, that wasn't necessarily a part of it as you had early on envisioned it, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think they needed a clock. I told Marge, uh, everybody wears wristwatch <laughs> now. Why do you want a clock up there? Yeah, but I told him there's one man in Omaha that doesn't wear a watch, and that's Bill Strauss. <laughs> and he does it. And he said he does look up there when he goes by. And he goes by it, you know, practically every day. Sure. So, um, uh, but even if you wear a watch, it's helpful sometime to check it. It was an interesting mm -hmm. thing, though, when they installed mm -hmm. the clock up there, the hands kept falling off of it. <laughs> what is that? And it had all the profs. Uh, they couldn't figure that out, why the hands would fall off. and. What had happened, they'd threaded the, there's a central clock in the tower, and then there's four arms that go out. That is four clocks, really. On yeah. Each yeah, yeah, it is. And they'd threaded the, uh, they'd threaded the rods wrong so that, uh, that when the hands turn, they just unscrewed themselves <laughs> off the head and <laughs> fell to the ground. So they had to send those back and rethread them. <laughs> well, I don't know. In people's homes as well as on campus, you talk about a conversation piece, uh, you know, something that's outstanding. And I don't think anything that'll ever be on our campus is more of an attraction than the Campania. And I suppose it reflects, as you'd intended, your feeling for the family for which you dedicated this march, doesn't it? Well, it was really dedicated to my parents and yeah. my sister. Yeah. And um, um, my mother loved music, and my sister loved music too. My dad appreciated music, and um, it just seemed. And he loved Iowa State and what it had, and so uh, it just seemed like this could be a nice tribute to them, something that would be uh, that each of them would relate to and and be very happy about. You know. <clears throat> As you reflect back over a long life and a long married life, I suppose there are a lot of high points as well as problems that you both had as a family. But uh, I imagine a lot of things too that have given you a lot of personal satisfaction. And uh, that often in most people's lives include people. You've mentioned some of them. But perhaps we could take a couple of minutes here as we wind down just to talk of some of the people in your own lives that you'd like to remember that have meant a lot to you and have often made a difference in your lives. You mean as far as, we've, we've touched on family. Yeah, even going beyond that. Beyond that, I mean, that I mean friendship, out. friendship. Yeah. One thing, I, I, I know Chuck has a lot, but one thing I'll always remember, and that is when Chuck and I were first married and came to Omaha after the war, and we had absolutely no money but there were some businessmen in Omaha who were really very kind to Chuck and uh, very supportive and um, really did a lot toward inspiring him and launching him forward in his efforts. And um, I think it'd be safe to say that some of these people were, I know one of them was Peter Kiewit, mm -hmm. and Peter Kiewit was a great mentor to Chuck. And, an inspiration to him, and so was Bob Storrs and V.J. Scott and and um, and Ted Maynard and a lot of those people were and and Bill um, Al um, Frazier, the you know the attorney, uh -huh. Al Sorensen. Al Sorensen. But some of those people really went out of their way to really be kind, to Chuck, and and they were very kind to me too, and and um, we were always grateful to them. And I think it made a difference because I think Chuck and I in turn. That meant enough to us that we would like to be able to do, in turn, to young people or for young people, a little something, give a little bit of that back. Uh -huh. Because they really were very kind, didn't have to be, they had nothing to gain by it no. at that point in time. Well, you know, we were really, after the war, I'm talking about World War II. Yes. We were, our company was, we employed about 20 people and we were 
the types of engineering and work we did was you know was pretty uh, simple compared to what they do today and uh, but nevertheless uh, these people here in Omaha would hire us for the big jobs and uh, we could go out then to other cities and say we've done this big project here in Omaha and, and it just sort of gave a springboard to, to build a, a good solid mm. business from. You know, Marge and I were coming back from New York last week. Come into Omaha after about four days in New York says, thank God we live here. Mm -hmm. You know, this is really a hell of a good place to live. I, it just well, it really is. After being back there, you have to fight for everything you do. Mm -hmm. Fight to cross the street. Then we're fight for a hotel room. To get served in a... And then fight the cashier. And oh, <laughs> God, it's an ex expensive. Just... And then and we you went, come back here and life's so simple. Then yeah. we went to San Francisco to relax. <laughs> we were on the 28th floor of the St. Francis Hotel. We got the daylight shaken out of us with the earthquake. No, we are back to Nebraska. So we were back history. to Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> so then we came back to Nebraska twice as glad to be back here again. We've never gone anywhere that we haven't been happy to come back here. Well, that's never nice gone to hear. We you love know, it here, and our family love it here, and, yeah. and uh, Omaha has been good to us, and we would like to, in some way to be good to Omaha because it's been wonderful to us. Maybe that answers a lot of the reason for some of the things you're doing uh -huh. in a philanthropic way now these last years. As you just said, Marge, so nicely giving back to, to the community and to young people some of the things you've gained from over the years. Well, it's been good to us. We have a, little civic, a lot of civic rent due. A lot of it due. You know, I think we could put on a tape like this, too, with all the years of experience mm -hmm. you people have had as parents and as a businessman. Mm -hmm. As a professional person, and uh, now that lives you're touching in the way of college students, when you, over the many years you've been involved in the business world, have hired someone, what kinds of people do you look for? What do you look for besides the good grades? What are some of the factors that make a man or a woman someone you like to have around you, Chuck? Well, uh, I've never really gone after people with the top grades. No. Mm -hmm. uh, if they have top grades, that's fine, but uh, uh, we've hired a lot of college graduates uh, without asking them what their grades were. Mm -hmm. Why did you do that? Well, I, I just don't think they're that important mm -hmm. in the kind of business I was in. Uh, people that can get along with other people well, that uh, are willing to work, they have good dispositions. and We did look at the activities they did in college. If mm -hmm. a kid worked his way through school, uh, I thought that was uh, something to his credit. Mm -hmm. If he was worked on the campus newspaper, was president of his class or something like that, those things meant more to me than whether or not he was the valedictorian of his class. Mm -hmm. Let's tell it as it is. Neither one of us were that bright either. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well be honest. We were we were not our students. Mm -hmm. uh, we both worked hard, but we were yeah. not our students. Yeah. That kind of thing. So, um, but Chuck, let me say this in fairness, Chuck, and I'm almost interrupting you to do it, but Chuck has an amazing insight into human beings. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't sound really logical to say that he doesn't care for grades. That isn't, I, I, I'm not sure he's absolutely accurate in that respect, but in visiting with someone, Chuck can tell if someone has what is needed. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that, that is academic. A real feel for people. He has a real feel for people. And not a lot, a lot of people can do that. A lot of people are not that, that candid and, and, and astute mm -hmm. in judgment. But he, but he has it. So I think that with that, and saying that, that, that accounts for some of the other things that yeah. he's expressed. You know, uh, Marge, I'd like to ask you, too, one more question at least. And that is, as I looked at that list of involvement mm -hmm. for you, 
I think it ran to 40 different groups. Did it? Yes, Let it me was tell unbelievable. You Paul, yes. that's too many. Here. Is it? <laughs> yeah, I have a trouble, more trouble making an appointment with her <laughs> for dinner or lunch or anything like that than I do anybody else. Yeah, but she answers the phone when I call. Uh, sure I do. <laughs> she may be sure on the I way do. somewhere. It's sure probably on a tape, though, isn't it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sometimes. No. No. But no, Marge, I'm, I'm trying to keep up with you. Yeah, and, and in doing this, and as you said earlier, some of the time you was gone so much, you got started to get involved. I don't, I don't want to just vegetate. What are your favorite projects? You've been in so many. What are the things that give you some of the most satisfaction, Marge, in your life now? The things that you're still tied in with, other than family? You were on the West Side School Board for 12 years. Well, I've, I've always lo loved working with young people. I really mm -hmm. have, and, and for things that I feel will benefit them. And that, of course, being one of them, um, I've enjoyed university work, you know, working with, you know, foundations and that sort of thing. And um, um, I've enjoyed Uta Holly, and I've enjoyed um, University of Nebraska Foundation, um, Methodist Hospital Board, that sort of thing. I enjoy meeting, you know, working with people and helping trying to meet needs. Mm. Uh, and I, I love the challenge of working with young people. And I'm speaking of the young people on the committees now mm -hmm. because there are just some super young people coming up in Omaha. There really are some young uh, volunteers and, and um, philanthropic people who are really out there going to do a lot for this community. And I find it exciting to work with them and challenging to work with them. Nice so, to hear you say something like that, because I think I look at you people, you've been mm -hmm. actively involved in your community, as you've described it, and as we mm -hmm. in the community know for umpteen years. There's no special reason why you both would need to continue to evidently work hard. What keeps people like yourself, Chuck, coming to the office? What are the, some of the challenges that you find interesting and exciting still? after all these years. Well, I tell you, Paul, if I could play golf better, <laughs> I'd probably retire. <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> but uh, I i don't know. I, I've always got a kick out of business and uh, here with my son and we've got, uh, we've got four CPAs in the office and an attorney and another engineer and uh, we're into a lot of interesting investments and things we're doing and uh, uh, you can either uh, you can either wear out or rust out mm -hmm. and I suppose I'll have to wear out size Marge doesn't want me around the house all that much <laughs> <laughs> she's not used to having you there you don't like to do dishes oh. <laughs> well nope. you just enjoy the continuing challenge of the work world evidently well I do yeah. Chuck loves a challenge and I love a challenge too. We both do. Any last last advice one would give? You've had a sizable family of your own. You've touched them in life. You're still very interested mm -hmm. in young people and in children mm -hmm. and in education. And you, as she suggested, have the ability to ferret out the good ones in hiring people. Any advice you'd give some young person who sits down to watch this tape? about and who's looking to make themselves a good future. Any basic things they ought to grab a hold of? Well, you know, the world is moving so fast. Do you want to answer this? Or you? I'd like to hear your answer. The world is moving so fast. And kids that graduate from college now are so much smarter than I was, or anybody our age. Mm -hmm. You take in the next 10 years, there'll be more scientific progress made since the time of Christ. And the kids that want to get ahead today have, have got to learn how to do something and do it well. Mm -hmm. They've got to get a good education and learn to read and read and read and work and work. And it's uh, there's a lot of opportunities there for the people that will grab it. But that would be my advice for what it's worth. But the basic worth ethic is still there. Well, you get in, there, in there and dig. It's more and more important than ever your education mm -hmm. and uh, reading ability and trying to keep up with it. You know, I it, 
it's incredible uh, what we've seen in the last 10 years, yeah. if you stop to think of it. Yeah. Marge, any thoughts on the subject on your part? Well, too, you touched on the, here? Well, you touched on the word work ethic, and I think that's extremely important. And Chuck and I had a very tough taskmaster in my dad. Mm -hmm. He was the world's hardest working man. I'll, Chuck and I'd put him up against anyone. I mean, 24 hours a day was nothing. Yes, that right. And, well, let uh, me tell you how he used to work. Some weeks, and this might go on for months at a crack, he'd only get to bed like three days in the week. He'd drive all night, work in the office all day, off again all night. He would take some young guy like myself, you know, to to drive to drive through the night or to with him. Change He'd go on one conference meeting, mm -hmm. and he was a bear of a strong man, uh, and uh, he just and he loved it. Wow! He loved to take. Uh, a young guy like myself just out of college, you know, we'd follow him around for about 16 hours, we'd be dead. You'd be dead to the world. <laughs> but he never knew anything but work. And the, everybody's different today. I've sure. never been a hard worker like that. Not a workaholic. No, no. Mm -hmm. No, but, but you learned uh, worth ethics from him. Mm -hmm. And, and he, he always maintained, if you're going to do a job, do it well. And he had great pride in what he did. And, and my mother had pride in what she did, too. And we, when you have that type of worth ethics drilled into you, I think it makes a difference. I think young people today should definitely have pride in what they do, really be proud of what they do, because um, they aren't going to do it well if they don't. You know, this has been a very pleasurable hour, having a chance to sit down and visit with you two, sharing your lives and what you've been doing here and at home and at work. and at our university and I and I want to thank you sincerely for for taking the time to do it. It's been a pleasure. We've well, enjoyed. thank you, Paul. <laughs> for what you. it's worth. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's worth thank a lot. Thank you and the university for what you're all doing because wow. you all are making a tremendous contribution. That's nice of you to say that. This has been so. a real a nice afternoon for all of us to pick your brains and get some more of your interesting mm -hmm. ideas and we've been doing as we have done for about 50 or 60 hours together and this particular series doing what we call Reflections in Time. And this has been the life and times of Marge and Chuck Durham and we thank them again for being with us for this fun hour of looking back at the past, the present and also the future.